in preparation for today's message, I invited people to send me stories of their miracles. And you know, the stories came in, one right after another. There were dozens of them. And as I reflect on them now, I'm thinking about more than one story about children, grandchildren, that were born at less than two pounds of weight. Situations that, in the eyes of doctors and nurses, might have been dire. But today, through God's sovereign grace, those are children that are healthy and strong. I think about more than one story of physical healing. One story of brain cancer. That's completely gone today. Without a surgery, without chemotherapy, without radiation. I think of my own physical healing. For more than six years, I've dealt with high blood pressure. About a month ago, I went to the doctor and my blood pressure was completely normal. And the doctor looked at me and he said, The medicine's working. Like, oh no, God's working. Because I've been on that medicine for years and it hasn't done a thing for me. I think of other stories that were submitted to me. One story in particular of a young lady who found herself partying all the time. Promiscuous living. Drugs and alcohol. But today, today is a faithful wife and mother free from any uh, 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 baggage that may have came from that situation, living free in Christ. I think of other stories that were submitted to me. Stories of suicide. Attempted suicide where they thought they had lost hope, but God. But God gave them hope to live, and today they are full of hope and following after Jesus. Stories. Don't you just... Love a good story. Especially stories that that grip your attention. Stories that somehow connect inside of us at the deepest parts of us to something that we're going through even right now. I don't know about you, but I'm a movie lover. I love to watch movies. It's It's a great escape for me. I love to just be able to turn off my brain for a couple hours and just sit there and watch a movie and unwind. But you know what movies I hate to watch? Movies that are about kids who are hurting or kids who are being hurt. You know why? Because it connects to my story right now. I begin to think about my four children. I begin to think about my parenting and what I would do if I were in the same situation as this movie is portraying. Anybody with me on that? I hate movies like that. They leave me feeling down. But don't you just love a good ending to a story? Don't you just love it when it all works out? When the superhero defeats the villain? Or the fourth grader stands up to the kid that's been picking on him? Or the marriage that's renewed and they find a deeper sense of love for one another? Don't you just love a success story? What I love about these miracle stories that were sent to me over the last couple of weeks is that story after story ended in success. Ended in miracle. And you know that's my hope for you today. That the stories I've just shared, the story I'm about to share with you, that somehow it will connect with and even intersect with your story. Because whether we recognize it or not, there is a story being written every day of our lives. And in some of those stories, we get to be the hero. Some of those stories were the villain. Some of those stories were just an extra watching the story unfold in front of us. But you see, the stories that I shared with you and the story that I want to share with you this morning, they all have one common thread, and that's the thread of miracle. You see, God did a miracle in each of those situations. In other words, God intervened. God inserted Himself into those moments, into those stories, and He did what only He could do in a way that only He could do it. And I think that's worth celebrating on Easter Sunday. In the Bible, you know, it's full of miracles. 
One, one person counted, and they came up with 182 miracles. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but whatever, whatever the number is, the Bible is a book full of miracles. Miracles where God showed up and did what only He could do in a way that only He could do it. In the resurrection story. The one we're focused on today is just one of those. You know, all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them, they recount and record the resurrection of Jesus. But Matthew, Matthew includes a little snippet, a little part that the other three don't. And that's what I want to focus on with you this morning as we consider the miracle of Easter. If you have your Bibles, you want to open up to Matthew chapter 27. If you don't have them, it's okay. We'll put the verses up on the screen. It says there in Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 50, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, He gave up His spirit. That's, that's the moment in the story where Jesus dies. It continues, At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, what you need to understand about Jewish culture was in the temple in those days, there was a section of the temple that was... That, 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 that was a space where no one could, do, could go except for the priest one time a year. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was. It's where the very presence of God was known to be. And if you went in there, you would die. And separating man and God's presence in that temple, there was, there was this curtain, this sheet, if you will, that went up to separate the two. But when Jesus died, when Jesus died, it tells us here in Matthew chapter 27 that 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 was torn. That that curtain that separated man from the very presence of God was torn in half. And in other words, man now had, in this very moment, in a moment, through Jesus' death, full access to the presence of God. Woo! That deserves an amen. That's an incredible miracle. That's a miracle, everybody. The verse continues, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. There was a great earthquake. There was so much going on in this moment. And then this is where I want you to focus your attention. It says, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Not only did Jesus come up out of the grave, but so did all of these people. They came up out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection, it says, and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Here's the point. It wasn't just one miracle that happened that day. There were a whole bunch of miracles that happened all in a moment. All in that one day that there was more miracles than we can count. And you know, Bible scholars, they look at this verse in Matthew and they just can't seem to agree on exactly what that means or exactly what happens. Each one of them, one right after another, just says, it's a miracle. I can't explain what happened. I can't explain how the tombs opened up and all of these holy people that were once dead are now alive. It's a miracle. And you know, if I'm being honest with you, maybe you can connect with this. It's easy for us. It's easy for us to connect our thoughts and our minds and our brains with this miracle that happened 2,000 years ago because it happened 2,000 years ago. For far too many of us, we say, yeah, I believe that. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I, I can see how that happened. I, I believe that that happened. And it's like we can go there with our minds because it happened a long time ago. But listen to me. I want you to grab a hold of this truth. God never stopped doing these things. The miracles did not stop. And He still desires, I believe, to do those things today. Are you sure, Pastor? Well, let's look at one more Scripture. One more Scripture. John chapter 14, starting at verse 12. It says there, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in Me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in My name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask Me for anything in My name, and I will do it. You see, God, He still wants to do a miracle here, today, for you, for me. It didn't come to an end back on Resurrection Sunday. No, He still desires to do these things today. And in fact, this is my hope for you. It's my big idea for you. If you're following along in the outline, you can fill it out. Easter isn't only meant to be remembered, it's meant to be experienced. Easter isn't only meant to be remembered, 
It's meant to be experienced. I don't want you to just marvel at something that happened 2,000 years ago. I mean, that would be enough if that was it, but that's not all there is to the story. Because I believe that there's so much more for each one of us. So much more for all of us here today. And I think that God intends for each one of us to understand that, that Easter, it's meant more than just a day of remembrance. It's meant, it's meant to be something that we experience. I think He would say to us today, experience the resurrection. Experience the miracle in your life. Because listen, there are so many of us today that would say, I desperately need a miracle. I need a miracle in my life. I need a miracle today. I came in here to give this whole God thing a try, this whole church thing a try, but I really need a miracle in my life. And if God's real, I need Him to show me through His miracle. I need a miracle in my marriage. I need a miracle in my finances. I need a miracle with my job. I need a miracle with my health. I need a miracle with my children. The miracle is here today, if you'll experience it personally. The miracle is here. How many of you, just a quick anecdotal survey, how many of you would say with 100% certainty that you've experienced a miracle from God at some point in your life? Just raise your hand way up. Yeah, look all over the place. God is still doing miracles. Look at that. Praise God. Praise God. God has absolutely not stopped doing miracles. And the best way we can celebrate Easter today is not just to look back at miracles in days gone by, but to experience a miracle today, right where we need it the most. Let me just show you three quick passages in Scripture to kind of reinforce this idea. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. In other words, whatever power, whatever energy it took to raise Jesus from the dead, it resides in you. It still exists today. And guess what? It's in you. It's in you. And just as, it continues, just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal marriage. He will give life to your mortal health. He will give life to your mortal relationships. He will give life to your mortality. He will give life to your mortal body. And how will He do it? By the same Spirit living within you. The same Spirit. Another Scripture, Ephesians chapter 1. I pray that you will begin to understand. I love that word, begin. Begin to understand how incredibly great His power is to help those who believe in Him. It's as if to say, because you don't. Because you don't fully understand. Because you haven't begun to understand how great His power is. And can I just say, somewhere along the way, the church has become powerless. The church has has lost its ability to tap into the very power and presence of God. And here, I think this admonition would be applicable to all of us today. Just begin to understand the power. Just begin to understand it. Because His power is limitless. It's the same mighty power, it goes on to say, that raised Christ from the dead. You see, Easter, it's not just meant to be remembered. It's meant to be experienced. The very power of God is available to you. It's available to me. And that power inside of us has the power to heal, to forgive, to repair, to set free, to reconcile, and to provide for you and for me at our deepest point of need. Here's a third verse, Philippians 3.10. All I want, Paul says, he's, he's boiled it down to just one thing, isn't that great? All I want is to know Christ and to experience, everybody say out loud, experience, experience. the power of His resurrection. That's all I want. That's it. That's all I want. I want to experience the power of His resurrecting life. My greatest dream for you, my hope for you, is not that you would have a deep church experience. It's not that you would have a deep religious experience, but that you would experience a miracle, the miracle of resurrecting life that can touch the dead and the dying parts of you. Not just a holiday experience. 
but personally experience the miracle and the power of the resurrection of Jesus because it is available for you today. And you know, we all face things in life. We all face moments and seasons of life where only a miracle will do. We face things in our everyday where we just need a miracle. We come to a point in our life and we say, okay, God, I've tried to figure it out on my own. I've tried to do it on my own. You're going to have to show up in a big way. We all come to those points where we say only a miracle will do. And I would doubt that there is not a person here today that would argue with the idea that a miracle sounds like a good idea. I doubt there's anybody here that would say, nope, nope, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really need miracles in my life. But the problem is, is that we've stopped believing in them. We've stopped believing for them. We've stopped believing that they're going to happen in our life. We say, yeah, a miracle would be great. And maybe we even find ourselves praying for a miracle, but in our hearts, we just simply don't believe it's going to happen. Not for us. Something's, something's turned us off. Something's gotten in the way. And whatever it is, it stopped us from believing that a miracle is possible for us. Personally, I think part of the problem is that we've, we've bought into some myths. Some myths that separate us from the presence of God and from believing that miracles are possible for us today. I want to rehearse three of them that I think are prominent today. Here's, here's the first. You can fill it in on your outline. Some people think that God is disinterested. It's the first myth that we buy into when we need a miracle. We think that God somehow is disinterested, that He simply just doesn't care. We've bought into the idea that He doesn't care about us. And if He does end up doing anything, it's completely random. God's just sitting up in heaven and He said, okay, I'll bless Bill today. And then He goes about doing other things. Somehow God is fickle in our minds. And He just doesn't care about what we're going through. Can I just say to you today that that couldn't be further from the truth? God cares about you. God cares about every detail of your life. He wants to be a part of the, of the deepest parts of your life. He cares about what you're going through. And He wants to help. But the first myth is that we somehow believe that God is disinterested in us and our circumstances. Here's the second myth that we buy into. We think somehow that God is deaf. That somehow he's intentionally turned a deaf ear on purpose to our plight. That he's not interested in listening to our prayers. And religion in large measure has contributed to this. It's convinced you, it's convinced me that he doesn't hear our prayers because of something we've done or something we haven't done. We think to ourselves, well, I'm just not, I'm not holy enough. I, don't, I just don't sing loud enough. I don't worship in the right way. I don't give enough. I don't pray enough. I don't have as much faith as so and so. So, of course, he's not going to hear my prayer. Like somehow there's some magical formula that God is just waiting on you to pray exactly in line with the right formula, and then, and then he will answer your prayer. It doesn't work like that. That's a lie. That's a lie. And God, he simply does not operate like that. But it's the second lie that I find all too often in people's lives. Here's the third. Some think God is dead. Some people think that God is dead. In fact, there are many people that think He, he just doesn't exist. Others who believe He exists, they believe, yeah, He did all of that stuff back then, but He just doesn't do it now. There's not one scripture that tells anything even close to that idea. There's no scripture that I can find in Old Testament or New Testament that leads me to believe that somehow he's stopped doing what he did back then. I've experienced his miracle working power in my life, so I know for a fact that he still does it. There's not one scripture that says, okay, I'm going to do all this stuff now, but future generations, I'm just going to leave it up to them to figure it all out. That's silly. It's a silly notion. But somehow we believe into it. It's just not there. In fact, the opposite is true. He always intended to do miracles. He always intended to do great things. Because the resurrecting power that we read about on Easter 2,000 years ago is alive and powerful inside you and me. It's alive. It's here. It's present. We can tap into it today. And so you're probably saying the next logical question, okay, pastor, if I believe that that's available to me today, how do I tap into it? 
How do I tap into the very power and presence of God? My answer is, I have no idea. Well, I have some idea. (laughs) But there's no magical formula. I want to share with you, hopefully, some practical things that will get you into position to receive from God. It's not a magical formula, formula, but I want to share these thoughts that I have on it. The first way that I think you can tap into God's power is to open up to God's power. Simply open up. Open yourself up. In other words, don't close yourself off to God. Open up to God's power. It's amazing to me the number of people that just shut out God's power altogether. They say, I'm just not going to go there. Something weird might happen. I mean, that was me a long time ago. I mean, I was raised in a church where there wasn't a lot of talk about miracles and movement of God and the presence and power of God. And I was always afraid that something weird was going to happen. I mean, I remember at one point praying, okay, God, I think I, think I want a little bit more of you, but if, you, if, you come, if, you, if I get more of you, you're going to have to behave yourself. <laughs> Anybody prayed that prayer? It's not a good prayer to pray, but, but it's an honest prayer. It's an honest prayer. But we close him out, but somehow we also think he can move in our life. We close him out, but then we think, God, I still need you to do something here, but yet we're not doing anything to open ourselves up to him. It doesn't work that way. Ephesians 4.18, let me say this then, speaking for the Lord, live no longer as the unsaved do, for they are blinded and confused. Their closed hearts are full of darkness. They are far away from the life of God because they have shut their minds against him and they cannot understand his ways. You can't close yourself off to God and expect to have the presence and miracle of God active in your life. So many of us say, well, let me, let me keep trying to figure this thing out. And then if I can't figure it out, then I'll turn to God. And it's backwards. It's backwards thinking. God God should be plan A, not our last resort. God wants to be the first place we turn. So we've got to open ourselves up to what it is God wants to do. Here's the second thing. Here's the second thing you can do. Is do whatever He tells you. Do whatever He tells you. You know, God is notorious for thinking and doing differently than we think and do. But we're so often only comfortable with, with His ways when, when, when He does things the way we think He should. And listen, until you get comfortable with His ways, you will never experience His powers. You will never experience the power of God until you get comfortable with His ways. If you can only have a relationship with God to the extent that everything fits within your thinking, then God can be no bigger than your thinking. I'm so happy that God has thoughts that aren't my thoughts and ways that aren't my ways. If God is only as big as my thinking, you don't want to follow Him. Because my thinking will limit Him every time. Stop filtering everything. Stop, stop trying to figure it out before it happens. And you don't have to trust me. Just trust His Word. Trust what His Word says. I want to look, at you for, look with you for a minute at a scripture where Jesus does something that I think is different than what we thought He would do. John chapter 2, maybe a familiar story. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana, Galilee. Now, back in this time, wedding, uh, weddings were all about the celebration. Today, we kind of make them about the ceremony. But back then, it was all about the celebration. And, and often, in Jewish culture, celebrations, they, they went on for six days. So this is the third day of this wedding celebration. And Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So it wasn't, wasn't their wedding, it wasn't his mother, you know, none of that. And w- the wine was gone. So the third day, they're partying, everything's going well, and then on the third day, no wine. Jesus' mother turns to him and he says, or she says to him, they have no more wine. As if to say, are you going to do something? Right? Have you ever had your mom say that to you? Going to do? Going to act? And listen, uh, she knew who Jesus was. She knew who Jesus was. She she was visited by an angel who told her who Jesus was. And I imagine growing up that he did miracles along the way. You may say, Pastor, no, no, no. This is his first miracle. No, this is his first public miracle. There's a difference. You know, like, like the time when Jesus and his family went to the public pool and he's walking on the water and she's like, Jesus, get, 
Get down from there. Get in the water like everybody else. <laughs> or Mary's baking cookies, and, and she's, oh, I'm out of flour. Jesus, Jesus, I'm out of flour. Go to the market. Oh, Mom, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my homework. I'm busy here. I'm playing video games. But I'm out of flour, and I want to make some cookies. Are you sure you're out of flour? You might want to check again. And she's got flour. She looks at him and she says, are you going to do something? They're out of wine. It's a celebration. It's a big deal in our community. Are you going to do something? Act. And then in typical male fashion, he looks at her and he says, woman, guys, it's, it's biblical. I mean, I use it with Consuela. Woman, I'd have a black eye if I ever used that with my wife, just to be clear. He looks at her and he says, Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replies, My time has not yet come. So Mary turns to the servants, basically ignoring what he just said, and said, Do, do. She says, Do whatever he tells you to do. You see, in this story, Jesus then in this moment, he doesn't just fill up the bottles of wine. That's how you and I would think he would accomplish a miracle. And that would still be a pretty cool miracle, wouldn't it? But instead, he does it in a way that none of us would have imagined. None of us would have thought. He says, no, go grab those huge washing basins. The ones you put water in to wash with. Much larger than that. And then he fills each one of them up. So that there's more than enough. Listen. He doesn't always work in the way that we think he will. He doesn't always work in the way that we think He could. We've got to be open to this. He so often works in a way that's different than we could ever think or imagine. He just does. It's just who He is. And until you become comfortable with His ways, you'll never experience His miracles. Your job isn't to perform the miracle. Your job is to just be obedient. Sometimes we fall into the, into the mode of thinking, well, what if I pray and it doesn't happen? Well, if it did happen, I wasn't going to take credit for it anyway, so why would I take blame when it doesn't happen? That's up to God. It's not up to you to do the miracle, it's up to Him. You be obedient, you cry, you pray, you you seek after Him. You go after Him and be obedient and be available to what He wants to do. And then here's the last thing you can do is to have faith in God. Have faith. Now, you may be saying, that's, that's actually my problem right now, Pastor. I just don't have faith right now. That's my question. I, 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 I'm open. I, I, I want to see God work. I'm open to whatever He wants to do. I'll do whatever He says, but I just don't have faith right now in God. And you know, faith, it's simply this idea, it's the confidence that God is going to do what He says He will do. And you know, the truth is about faith is that our confidence in God is a direct correlation with our closeness with God. Our confidence in God comes from our closeness with God. And the closer you are to God, the more faith you will have. I think about me and Consuela, you know, the early days of our marriage, I didn't have much faith in her, but the more years that go by, my faith grows in her. Why? Because I'm around her often. I spend time with her regularly. I see the times when she is faithful, and it grows my faith in her. You've got to be close. How do you increase your faith in God? Move close to Him. Be close to Him. Spend time with Him. And so that's that's the entire message today. Open up. Open up to what God wants to do. Do whatever it is He says He wants to do. And then lastly, have faith that He's going to do it. Because for far too many of us, only a miracle will do. You know, if I ask you right now, what do you think the greatest miracle of all is? For some of you, you may say, you know, healing somebody that's blind or somebody that's deaf. Or for others, you may say, raising somebody from the dead. That's, that's a pretty great miracle. I think that there's an even greater miracle than those. And it's a miracle of closeness with God. It's found in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 17, it says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. 
And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will ever harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. That's not the greatest miracle. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's the greatest miracle. That's where it lies. 